Millersdale for Tideswell, Kirby Muxlow, Malcop and Scholar Green. No more would I go to Blandford Forum and Morty Ho. On the slow train from Midsummer Northern and Mumby Road. No churns, no porter, no cat on a seat. At Chalton come Harney or Chester the Street. We won't be meeting again on the slow train. I'll travel no more from Littleton Batsy to Openshaw. At Long Stanton, I'll stand well clear of the doors no more. No whitewashed pebbles, no up and no down. From Formby Four Crosses to Dunstable Town, I won't be going again on the slow train. On the main line and the good siding, the grass grows high at Dog Dyke, Tumby Woodside, and Trouble House Halt. The sleeper sleep at Audlem and Ambergate. No passenger waits on Chittering Platform or Cheslin Hay. No one departs, no one arrives. From Selby to Goole, from St. Earth to St. Ives, they all passed out of our lives on the slow train. On the slow train. Cockermouth for Buttermere. On the slow train. Armly Moor Adam. High Hill and Summer Coats on the slow train. Windmill End. Welcome to Scale Forum 2000, Britain's premier 4mm fine scale model railway exhibition. For their first exhibition of the 21st century, the Scale Force Society has assembled a top selection of layouts, traders, demonstrators, lectures and other exhibits. Before we explore the layouts, let's take a few minutes to look at some of the preparations behind an exhibition of this size. The complex task of reassembling and testing the layouts begins on Friday afternoon. This next sequence of the spittle layout shows just part of the work that goes into setting up an exhibition layout. Actually, if all goes well, it takes around two hours to completely reassemble a layout of this size for exhibition. However, changes in temperature from club room to car to exhibition hall can cause realignment problems with the track. By Saturday morning, and after a great deal of hard work, all is ready and tested for the show to open to the public at half past ten. Erich, under construction. Until as late as 1965, Erich was an important hub on the ex-LBSCR Outer Circle route to Brighton. Direct services operated to Brighton, Eastbourne via the Cuckoo Line, Tunbridge and London via Oxted and East Croydon with an often intensive interval service. Today, Erich Station still exists almost intact, 
but it is now only a little used stop on the truncated line to Uckfield. The Cuckoo Line was closed in 1965. Through services to Brighton were lost in 1969. The last train on the short link to Tunbridge Wells ran in 1985. The layout shows Eridge in the 1950s. Exclusively steam, the line was never electrified, and in a transition period where a variety of changes were affecting both locomotives and coaching stock. XLBSCR locomotives were giving way to XSECR, Southern and Standard types, while the new Bullied and Mark I coaches were making inroads into services long operated with XSECR birdcage sets, Mansell stock and LBSCR push-pull sets. This period also gives us the opportunity to justifiably show a range of passenger stock liveries. Carmine and Cream, Plain Carmine and the Southern Green permitted from 1956. You may even see stock still in late SR Malachite repaints. Although predominantly passenger oriented, there were also daily pickup goods on both the Brighton and Eastbourne lines. This is the first outing for Eridge, not to mention most of its operators, and it appears at scale forum as a layout under construction. First conceived as a project in late 1997 by the newly formed Kent area group of the Scale 4 Society, it has progressed to its current state following lengthy research and considerable climbing of learning curves by most concerned. The layout is as true to scale as the group could make it over its visible length, with some minor adjustments to turnout positions to cater for baseboard joints. Whilst on first sight it may look like a terminus station, this is just an illusion due to the station buildings being situated on an overbridge. The group have exploited this as a convenient truncation point for the layout at the southern end. Track work is all hand built using Brooks Smith ply sleepers, C&L chairs and steel rail. Stock is kit built from the wide range available for Southern these days, which enables virtually any train likely to have used Eridge in the 1950s to be modelled. Being under construction, there are a lot of absences. Buildings, full scenery, signalling. However, the group hope to have the opportunity to return to Scale Forum in the not too distant future with the layout as near to final completion as possible. Devil's Dyke Branch John Taylor's inspiration for the Dyke project came in the chance discovery of a history of the line by Paul Clark, published in 1976, and further photographic material by Vic Mitchell and Keith Smith, published in 1983. The Dyke Branch, which ran from 1887 until 1938, was five and a half miles from Brighton. The final three miles commenced at Dyke Junction Holt, to be renamed Aldrington Holt in 1932. The terminus, unique in having no buffer stops, at least for passengers, was reached after a climb from the junction of 415 feet. At this point, it was 501 feet above sea level and 200 feet below the highest point on the South Downs. Within walking distance of the station site is the Devil's Dyke, a precipitous gorge in the Downs, 
created, according to legend, by the devil attempting to destroy the Wealdon villages and churches by striking a cleft in the downs to let in the sea. This beauty spot would appear to be the main reason for the construction of the line, which developed into a popular Victorian tourist route to the Dyke and its funicular railway. In the final years, it was a favourite destination for courting couples. This picturesque diorama depicts the final few years of the line's existence. It represents five years of construction from baseboard, track, scenery and stock construction. The addition of working ground signals and station lighting complete the lazy branch line atmosphere on this small but very attractive layout. Clecklewick. Clecklewick is a tiny diorama of part of a West Yorkshire station based very loosely on Halifax North Bridge and inspired by Ian Rice's ideas on Bitzer stations. Ian Everett has built it very much as a testbed to try out P4 and as such it is interesting for beginners to see what can be done by a newcomer to P4 working entirely on his own with limited cash, space and time. Unlike most such efforts, it is essentially secondary mainline urban rather than backwater rural in character and it represents ex-LNWR in BR early diesel period. Scenery comprises retaining walls, bridges, a scruffy canal with locks, mills, terraced houses, etc. Inspired by a marvellous book called The Essential West Riding, the terrace contrasts nicely with the ubiquitous picturesque GWR branch termini. Ian plans to extend the layout by incorporating the terminus at Bradford North Western, together with a new branch. This will be modelled on the real terminus at Burstall, which is the nearest the LNWR actually got to Bradford before it gave up. Rolling stock so far is mostly kit-built, or re-wheeled proprietary with locos on Perseverance chassis thus demonstrating what can be achieved without exceptional skills or workshop facilities. Operation is by homemade block bells. The use of cassette fiddle yards and vertical storage racks enables a small layout to be well populated with trains. At exhibitions a random sequence of typical trains is represented as timetable operation is under development. On the extended layout, Ian plans to use a digital Crispin computer-based signal box emulator to operate one of the fiddle yards. Competitions. No scale forum would be complete without the competitions. Each year, four are contested over the weekend and these provide much inspiration and interest. This year's Chairman's Cup class winners were Chris Pendleton in Class 1, Kevin Bradbury in Class 2, Simon Stevens also won a commendation in this class, Alan Coppin in Class 3, Peter Wilson in Class 4. Philip Hall won the Cumberland Bowl. And the Chairman's Cup was won by Chris Pendleton. Steve Hall took the MRJ Chalice. 
while the Irwell Novice Shield was won by Philip Baxendale. The Deputy Chairman's Cup tests running performance over a specially built test track. High build quality and precision are required to succeed in this category. The winner in Class B was Jim Wright Smith for his run converted Lima HST power car. First in Class A and winner of the Deputy Chairman's Cup was Richard Dunning's scratch-built Impetus Bagnall 16-inch tank. The competition was organised and run by members of the North East and Scottish area groups. We'll find out who won the York Trophy later, but now let us return to the show and take a look at the other layouts. St Merrin in developing this layout, the Scale 4 Society South London Area Group has incorporated the experience gained from several years on the exhibition circuit with Wanborough Camp. They have endeavoured to make the layout even lighter and easier to handle and erect. Baseboards are constructed from 6mm ply with foam board stiffening alignment being by the usual combination of bolts and dowels. The four scenic boards are supported for their full length on a pair of rectangular aluminium box beams which span between the trestles at each end. The fiddle yard comprises a narrow spine beam supporting a turntable deck designed to minimise the need to handle stock. The inner end of the spine beam is bolted to the end scenic board, the outer end being supported by a camera tripod, which provides any necessary vertical adjustment that might be required. A separate removable fiddle yard with a cassette loading system is provided for the harbour branch. The track plan is developed from one appearing in an article in Modeler's Backtrack, which in turn was based on Padstow. The group have added the harbour branch in place of the key sidings at Padstow because of space constraints. Track is hand built using the Brook Smith system of rivets set in thin ply sleepers with steel rail being soldered to the rivets. Cosmetic chairs were added later after test running to confirm satisfactory track and rail alignment. The track is founded on cork sheet and the sleepers painted with a medium grey acrylic wash prior to ballasting. The latter was accomplished with a variety of materials woodland scenic light grey ballast on the main running lines, cinder ballast in the carriage sidings, and H&M fine grey ballast in the goods yard and engine shed areas. Ballast was applied after track laying, the coarser ballast being laid dry and secured with dilute PVA adhesive. The fine ballast was sprinkled dry onto areas which had been pre-coated with adhesive. As so much of the visible area is occupied by track work, the opportunity for scenic contouring is limited. The group have attempted to suggest the ground contours adjacent to the railway boundary, but the road bridges at the exit to the fiddle yard are the only major earthworks on the layout. They have, however, also managed to arrange some variation in track level on this end scenic board and in the coal yard at the opposite end of the layout. Buildings are mostly scratch built in plastic, using embossed plastic hard and Will's materials sheets as appropriate. 
although some modified kits have also been employed where suitable. The main railway structures, station building, signal box, goods shed and road bridges are based on North Cornwall line architecture, although the loco shed is based on that at Ilfracombe and represents construction using the large Muri block, concrete blocks produced by the Southern Railway. Spittle. In Scale 4 News, Issue 40, Eric Colling of the then Durham Area Group wrote, As soon as we can get our hands on some steel rail, things will happen pretty quickly. The steel rail was dutifully manufactured and combined with the bare baseboards to produce spittle, a single line continuous run with cassette type stock storage facilities. Whilst the location is fictitious, the original intentions were for spittle to be representative of the eastern foothills of the Pennines, and in particular the Stainmore line. This crosses one of the bleakest and most desolate areas of England and the Cleveland Model Railway Society hope that their efforts to capture some of the flavour of the open fells have met with a modicum of success. The track layout is lacking any passenger facilities providing a passing loop with a signal cabin, goods yard and coal cells. Additionally, a siding serves a stone loading facility for one of the quarries found higher up in the fells and adds a little to the presentation and operational potential of the layout. Stock used on the layout has often come from a diverse range of sources. However, the society have been fortunate in having the assistance of Ian Sadler and Dave Fenny. The stock generally seen is representative of NER practice circa 1910 and is likely to have been seen in the area depicted at that time. The layout is now held by Cleveland MRC as custodians at their club rooms in Boosbeck where members have carried out maintenance to counteract the effects of time and occasional damage. The Society have sole use of the rooms and any Scale 4 members in the area would be welcomed if they wish to take advantage of the continuous run facility when the layout is in operation. Marlborough Marlborough was a classic example of the aggressive attitude that the GWR frequently adopted towards competitors. The Swindon, Marlborough and Andover Railway, SMAR, originally joined the GWR operated Marlborough Railway, MR, just to the south of the MR terminus. The SMAR then had running powers to Savernake after which it rejoined its own metals and continued south towards Andover. This arrangement was financially beneficial to both companies. However, the GWR was continually awkward and obstructive to the SMAR trains. So much so that eventually a new company was formed, the Marlborough and Grafton Railway, to build a new line between the two halves of the SMAR. On completion in 1891, the MR and the SMAR were amalgamated and became part of the Midland and South Western Junction Railway. At the same time, the junction with the MR was lifted to make the two systems totally independent, having separate stations on either side of the road. The MSWJR 
formed an important north-south link between the Midland Railway and the LSWR, allowing the Midland and LNWR access to the south coast and, most importantly, Southampton docks. Built by Philip Young, the layout shows the GWR Marlborough Railway terminus, together with the MSWJR main line running past towards Marlborough Tunnel, as they were in about 1911. The trackbed of the former junction can just be seen near the GWR branch goods shed. The branch was originally built as broad gauge and the Bork Road was retained at the gauge conversion and not replaced until 1916. It has been suggested by some that it was never replaced. As a result, the track work on this part of the layout had to be specially fabricated to give the correct appearance. In contrast, the MSWJR used conventional cross-sleeper track. The plain track was constructed using C and L chairs glued to ply sleepers and the turnouts are of ply and rivet construction with cosmetic chairs. Buildings are all scratch built and locos and rolling stock are a mixture of kits and scratch built. But Scale Forum is not just about layouts. Organised by the Scale 4 Society and covering many aspects of fine scale modelling, the demonstration area in the upper hall was as popular as ever. These demonstrations give a wonderful opportunity to the beginner and the more experienced modeller to learn at first hand from the experts. Once again, a wide range of subjects were covered, including modern ready-to-run conversions, Howell Reese, etched kit construction, John Brighton, track work, Tony Wilkins, Alex Jackson couplings, Tony Williams, building construction, Ted Coglin, paint and line, John Dobson, loco construction, David Holt, trees, Eric Kemp, wagon construction, Simon D'Souza, and plasticard construction, Jeff Kent. Meanwhile, downstairs in the main hall, a huge selection of models and accessories were on offer from over 40 trade stands. These ranged from basic brushes, paints and tools, to road vehicles, locos and rolling stock, videos, books and magazines, both second-hand and new, were also available. You could even have your track planned on a computer. Each year, Scale Forum offers this unique opportunity to purchase modelling items from specialist traders from across the country, and all under one roof. With the winter modelling season fast approaching, many visitors were tempted by special show offers too good to miss. Calloland, under construction. Those of you who attended Scale Forum 99 will remember Calloland. 
The layout was partly constructed at last year's show to demonstrate to the novice P4 baseball construction, track building, layout wiring and rolling stock conversion. As you can see, the Watford and District Model Railway Club have made great progress in the past 12 months. Construction of the baseboards and track work are now complete, while work continues on rolling stock, fences and buildings. The layout is based on a section of the St Albans branch between Watford North Station and the A41 road bridge. The period is set at September 1995 and the builders aim to reflect the low period at the end of British Rail. It has been assumed that the sidings which have now been lifted were still in situ. When completed, traffic will reflect the industry still operating in the area, together with current passenger services. The name adopted for the layout, Calloland, was the original name of Watford North Station. Halifax King Cross Halifax King Cross represents Steve Hall's first attempt at building a P4 layout and has taken 10 years to reach completion. The model is based on the Halifax High Level Railway which was a short branch line opened in 1890 to carry coal and goods traffic to the higher regions of Halifax. The cost of construction of the line was far greater than anticipated and as a result the line terminated at St Paul's station. This was somewhat short of the intended terminus which would have been in the district known as King Cross. The model depicts what the station might have been like if the funds had not run out. The line was operated jointly by the Great Northern and the Lancashire and Yorkshire Railway Companies. The passenger service was withdrawn in 1917 due to competition from the 3 foot 6 inch gauge Halifax Electric Tramway. But goods traffic continued until 1960 when the line finally closed. The model is set during the line's last year of operation and Steve's aim is to represent a typical West Riding urban scene. Special features on the model include working point rodding and facing point locks, working loco and wagon turntables, operating signals and block bells. The track is all hand built using riveted plywood sleepers with cosmetic plastic chairs. Control is via two pentrollers, while points are switched by Fulgurex slow action. Stonework is a mixture of DAS modelling clay, hand embossed card and Will's plastic sheets. The thousands of stone sets are all embossed DAS and are painted with watercolours which give a really pleasing natural finish. Chagford Like Marlborough, the Chagford layout also has two stations. Chagford itself is a single platform country station, whilst Oakhampton is a single platform terminus. The line was classified as a blue route 
and was predominantly worked by 48 XXs and 57 XXs, with the occasional appearance of a Dean Goods. Passengers were catered for mainly by auto coaches and a branch B set. At Chagford, goods traffic was primarily geared to the dairy industry, especially at Chagford, where the dairy and associated cheese factory were adjacent to the station building. Due to this, the makeup of branch goods trains was weighted in favour of vans. Minks, siphons, pythons and even fish vans were used to distribute the cheese. Four and six wheel tankers also carried milk to London. Coal, cattle and prize bulls along with agricultural produce and feedstuffs formed the remainder of the goods traffic. Oakhampton traffic was mainly coal, as evidenced by the extensive coal sidings and ladders from the nearby Meldon Ladder Works. Chagford station building and signal box are kits, but all the other buildings are scratch built. Most are based on actual prototypes. You may even recognise one or two of them. In building Chagford, Brian Lewis's aim was to depict a busy single line track. Considering how well the GWR has been documented, it is extraordinary that so little has been published about the extension from Morton Hampstead to Oakhampton. If you did not know better, you could be forgiven for thinking it was nothing more than the product of a modeler's imagination. There is a working timetable, but in the manner of train operators today, the Chagford crew pay only scant attention to it. Calder Bridge Calder Bridge, built by Newcastle and District Model Railway Society, is an imaginary industrial town in West Yorkshire, linked by the North Eastern Railway to York and Leeds. The Lancashire and Yorkshire Railway has running powers into the station and provides local services to Wakefield. The layout is set at the height of the Edwardian pre-grouping era, circa 1905, and is operated to a sequenced timetable. The Society's aim in building the layout has been to provide a range of operation in an urban and industrial setting. As you can see, they have been wonderfully successful in their aims. The layout is packed with interest and detail. Everywhere you look, there are fascinating glimpses of day-to-day -day Edwardian way of life. The track plan, signalling and railway architecture all derive from northeastern railway practice, with the train shed and goods shed being based on York and North Midland railway prototypes. The baseboards are plywood while the track is a mixture of C and L flexi track plus hand built points using the plywood and rivet method. Electrically, the layout is divided into eight sections, each of which can be connected to any of the three controllers. The buildings are all scratch built using a variety of materials and are generally based on actual West Yorkshire locations, while the signals 
have been assembled with D and S parts and are worked either by smart wire or modified relays. The locomotives and stock are provided by individual members of the group and are mostly kits with some scratch built items. The Calder Bridge team were the deserved winners of this year's York Trophy competition. The trophy is awarded to the best layout as voted for by the visitors to the show. This is the second time the Calder Bridge has been awarded this honour, the last being back in 1995. In his show guide introduction, the Society's chairman, John Chambers, hoped that, above all, Scale Forum would provide inspiration. As you have seen in this film, Scale Forum 2000 certainly gave inspiration to all, both beginner and expert. Arrangements for next year's show to take place here at the Leatherhead Leisure Centre on the 29th and 30th of September 2001 are well in hand. The Society hope that you will be there to enjoy the finest model railway exhibition of the year. The sleeper sleep at Audlum and Ambergate. No passenger waits on Chittering Platform or Chesley Hay. No one departs, no, no one arrives from Selby to Goole, from St. Earth to St. Ives. They all pass out of our lives on the slow train. The slow train. Talk about the Buttermere. On the slow train. Armly Moor Adam. Pie Hill and Summer Coats. On the slow train. Windmill End. 